I only need a couple more things before I can drive this car around the block. One of them is steering. That's pretty important. I should probably put a seat in there. We'll call that part of steering. The other thing I need is a cooling system, or more accurately, a thermal management system. I mentioned in a previous video that I could adapt the entire thermal management system from a Model 3 into this car. Tesla neatly packages their clever and complex system up front here in this cube with the 12 volt battery. I may still do this in the future, but for now, I'm just gonna plumb up a radiator. The cooling rectangle, or radiator as it is more commonly called, is not very large on the Tesla. Electric motors are far more efficient than internal combustion engines, so they're not just dumping gobs of waste heat into the environment. But EVs do generate heat, and that heat does need to be rejected. In my previous video, I talked about active cooling and passive cooling. Passive is the radiator rejecting heat as air moves through it. Active is when the air conditioning compressor brings the coolant down to a temperature below the ambient air outside. I probably don't need this. Why, if Tesla needs it on their car, do I not need it on my Tesla-powered car? Well, Tesla designs their cars for many use cases around the world, from negative 40 below in Norwegian winters to hauling a fully loaded car up a hill in scorching temperatures with the AC on full blast. They plan for a lot of corner cases, but I live here where we complain when the temperature drops below 60. That's 15 Celsius for all of you that will complain in the comments if I don't convert it for you. In fact, for this video, I'm gonna get help from my metric friend, Super British Matt. You can tell he's a Brit because of the racing green helmet and because he has a monocle for some reason. In any case, I drive in an environment that will allow the powertrain to run with just a radiator most of the time. I'm going to add active cooling with the chiller, but I'm going to do that later. I'm also going to just run everything in one big loop instead of having three separate cooling loops like Tesla does. Tesla has separate loops for the battery, the penthouse, and the drive units. Their complex cooling system sends the correct temperature coolant where it needs to be so everything is happy. But again, I can get away with a simpler system. So I'm gonna go from the radiator to the drive unit where we have the inverter and then the oil cooler. From there, it will go to the outhouse, which has some hot electrical stuff, uh, DC, DC, maybe some other stuff. From there, it goes to the manifold, which will split it into four tubes, one going through each one of the battery modules. Then it's back to the radiator. In that loop, I will also have a couple of pumps, a radiator bypass, and a swirl pot, all of which I will talk about in a moment. The first thing we need to do is get the radiator in so I can mount it to the frame. I got rid of the old Jaguar radiator that came with the car, partly because I didn't know if it would leak or not, but mostly because it weighed 40 pounds. I estimated the required size of the radiator by just kind of eyeballing the one in the Model 3. I bought one that was a little bit bigger and fit neatly behind the grill. It's actually quite a bit bigger, and I thought about cutting a few rows off the bottom and welding caps on to shorten it, but it'll be fine this way. Too much cooling is enough cooling. I'm gonna weld up an aluminum stand and I'm gonna mount it directly to the frame, but I need to know where on the frame to mount it. And for that, I need to install the grill, which I did last week. Aw oh, yeah, man, that looks good. Except the firewall, that needs paint. And I should probably do that before I keep bolting stuff to it that I'll need to remove, like these bars that hold up the grill or some coolant pumps or something. Yeah, I'll do that. But first I need to remove everything, the wiper motor, these old electronics, and of course the brake booster and proportioning valve. I should have done this before I put the brakes on, but I was trying to get the brakes working for my move, but I didn't even do that. I also pulled off the VIN plate, which has pertinent info on lubricants to use. Now, if you look carefully, you'll see that there is an area here I need to patch before I keep moving. It's a little tough to see, but there's kind of a hole right there. You see that? Is that hole? Yeah, so I need to patch that. That was where the 12 volt battery used to be. 12 volt batteries being what they used to be, uh, this one leaked onto the pan and basically chewed out the entire pan. There was a huge hole in it. So I had to cut it all out and to replace the uh, transmission tunnel for the same reason. But I don't actually need a tunnel, so I just blocked it off. So I'm gonna cut out a piece of steel and panel bond it in there. And then uh, just paint that and we'll have that all patched up. I'm not going to get this down to the bare metal, but I do need to get off all the rust and all the black paint. This car wasn't originally black, it was this gray color. Somebody repainted it at some time and they didn't do a great job. 
You can see what looks like body filler here, but I'm pretty sure that's actually just the primer that Jaguar originally used. You can see some more of it here. I wiped this down with some rust converter just to make sure all the rust was neutralized, and then I put some SPI epoxy primer on it. This stuff is great, super durable, self-etching, and it has UV resistance, so I don't need a top coat. Typically you would spray this on, but I'm just going to brush it on. It will leave brush marks on the paint, but this whole area is pretty rough, so it's not going to matter. We'll let that dry and then put the grill back on. Oh yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's really shiny, like super shiny. You can see your reflection in it. Hey look, you're a GoPro. That's too shiny. I'm gonna put some semi-gloss on it to tone it down. Aw oh, yeah, that actually looks great but it really highlights how ugly this part is, so I'll have to paint that. See, this is why I don't clean things. You know what, I'm sick of looking at this front end. Let's make a swirl pot. What is a swirl pot? Well, it's just a tank in the system with an offset inlet, so the coolant swirls around kind of like a toilet. This helps de-aerate the coolant, meaning it just gets all the little air bubbles out of it. This is a large cooling system spread out over the whole car, so there are places for air bubbles to get trapped, which is bad for flow and cooling. Hopefully with this thing, the little bubbles will all swirl out here and we'll have a system full of coolant. I might not actually need this because unlike the Tesla, I have a radiator that has a fill cap at the top and a bit of air. This does a pretty good job of getting the air out since the inlet is at the top and the outlet is at the bottom. But the radiator fill cap is not the highest point in my system because I have the outhouse in my trunk. Now, if I had a tall radiator like the original one with the filler cap way up here under my little chrome kitty, then it would be the highest point. But I don't want to do that. Maybe I could do some sort of tall extension cap on the top or fill the coolant with a car parked on a hill or something. But no matter what I do, this area back here will still be a local high spot. So I could still collect air up here. So we're going to do the swirl pot. I want to mount the swirl pot to the wall at the front of the trunk. Unfortunately, there is no wall at the front of the trunk, just the springs of the back seat, so I'll need to make one. I decided to use wood here, and I don't want to use plywood, so I used some hardwood that I had lying around. I cut it to size and glued two pieces together so they'll fit the whole area. Then I put some exterior stain on it, and of course the stain made the glue really stand out. I should maybe have used a jointer or router to get a flat edge, but you know what? I don't care. We are nine minutes into a thermal management video and we've managed none of the thermals. I'll just put a paint marker line down the middle and move on with my life. Swirl pots are never the exact size you need and when they are, they're expensive. So I just bought a header tank. I'm gonna weld on an inlet and replace the outlet. I also need to modify the mount. I'm gonna screw it to the front of the trunk but I don't want it at the angle that the wood is at so I'm gonna modify the mount by cutting it, bending it out, and welding in a patch plate. After that, I welded in a new inlet and a new outlet. For this, I just used some 3 quarter inch tube. It needs to have a bead on the end to keep the hose from slipping off, so I used a beading tool. These are great. You just rotate the smaller hex and it pushes the little ball bearings out. Then you rotate the whole thing, which pushes out a bead in the aluminum. Do this a few times and you have a bead in your tube. I also added a couple of tapped holes so I could put in a sight tube to check coolant level. Before we install it, we need to pressure test it. I have a thing for this. We'll just run a hose in a loop, pump it up, and spray it with some soap to see if we have any... Yep, that crappy weld in the back, just where I thought it would leak, just as I suspected. So I'll re-weld that, test it again, and we're good. Okay, so that's done, but we need to plumb it into the system. The outhouse had this tube that is the highest spot, so I just drilled a hole through the case, and I'm gonna add the swirl pot in line right there. I'll need to seal it up around this hole with some silicone so the outhouse can stay dry. This can has an overflow, but I don't actually need an overflow. If the coolant in this car gets hot enough to push this cap open, that means the car is on fire. You know, now that I have this all done, I think I probably don't need it. If I have a pump right before the outhouse, that will probably be adequate to push any air out of this high spot. Then I could just put a riser on the radiator to make it the highest point and I'd be good. Sometimes the best way to do something doesn't become clear until you've done it a different way. In any case, it's fine for now. Some of you are wondering why I'm not welding on a table instead of welding on this upside down plastic storage container that is now on fire. It's because I parked my car on the side of the garage that has the power outlets and I put my table on the side of the garage that doesn't have any power outlets. And I haven't got around to switching that yet. Also, welders aren't super keen on extension cords, so I'm stuck here. Unless...
So let's mount the radiator. I'm going to weld up an aluminum stand for this. I'm making it out of some two inch by three inch aluminum angle. If I put four bolts at the bottom corners, that should constrain it pretty well. I'll probably also add a triangulation support back to the frame to add some rigidity. Triangles are great. The engineer's best friend. Super efficient. Yeah, okay, it's not the best. I would say for an engineer, above average. But for now, I'm just gonna set it right here. Boy, we haven't really gotten very far. I mean, we got the swirl pot, which we might not even need, and the radiator is just sort of sitting there. But we still need the pumps and the bypass valve and all the adapters and the hoses. On the next cooling video, we'll paint the sides here and maybe paint the fender wells. We'll do some woodworking, and then maybe at the end, we'll do a little bit of cooling stuff. Maybe. It used to be that you had to impress people to get people to watch your show. Now you just have to impress the algorithm. So do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. All hail the algorithm. Next week, the Jag gets Prius technology. Ooh.